I did um, do my dissertation research on Chinese graduate students in the US. They are not necessarily immigrants per se, but you know, I did quite some research on, on immigration as a result of that. So yeah, I'm currently, you know, trying to uh, write up something on immigrants. So that would be, yeah, definitely. Well, okay. Henry just joined us and he was one of the researchers who was in the earlier session talking oh. about immigration, so. Nice mm -hmm. to meet you, nice to meet you, Cynthia. Nice to meet you uh, as well, so nice to meet you. So, so you are doing uh, immigration uh, research. That's a very interesting, important topic. Um, talking to me? Oh, I said, oh, Cynthia talking to me or to Patty? Yeah, to you. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm doing international. But mostly, as I was chatting with Patty this morning, mostly in the Caribbean and Central American migration process toward the United States. It's very localized what we're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but that area, I think, you know, I was trying, you know, it's, um, I mostly I did some like uh, background info, you know, um, information check. I apologize, I still like, uh, I'm in casual dresses. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, like it's just grab something in the morning. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, it's, it's, um, I think immigrants from all over the world uh, have a lot in common. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for those coming from the Caribbean area, Asia, Africa, um, you know, it, it's, it seems to me that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like cite, uh, citing the, 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 the literature. Early immigrants uh, had a lot in common with um, African-Americans, you know, there, mm -hmm. some of them were, from uh, slaves and everything. But nowadays, I guess it's mostly uh, technology, high skill. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are. And then a mm -hmm. lot of them are still in the low skill um, mm -hmm. uh, work, uh, workforce. And, uh, and they kind of like compete with the local uh, immigrants who are concentrated in <clears throat> the low pay, low paying jobs and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so. Actually in Canada, the top five uh, immigrants uh, are coming to Canada, I'm mostly from South Asia, mm -hmm. mostly from South Asian countries, I think it's China, China, mm -hmm. India, and I don't remember the other three, but they are highly, highly, highly educated. Yeah, highly. well, I think it's the majority of them are highly educated. That's the immigration policy, right? Yeah. yeah. To fill the, the quota or whatsoever. And, and, and the other thing they're doing is the speed, what are, how do they call the speed path to a permanent residence. If you land and you are doing a degree, a master PhD degree, after the second or the third year, you qualify to apply as a grant as a permanent resident. The logic is you're here. We know, we know you are going to become highly qualified. You are young because within the young, so they speed up the process. That's, I think, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, but but there are also a lot of uh, imi, uh, immigrants from uh, from Asia that are in the low paying jobs, you yeah. know, um, and um, yeah. So I think it's kind of like two extremes, and uh, yeah, and in terms of the high highly skilled uh, immigrants and um, Yes, that's the case. And um, I mean, you know, they, 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 they came with um, education or they came for education and then stay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the, the, the immigration policy has changed. I mean, you know, it's, has, ha, it, it's always the immigration policy for, for people from Asia, you know, like, you know, if you're highly skilled and everything, you have the skills we need, then. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you know, you go through a process, but you will get your, uh, yeah. yeah. As I was sharing with Patty this, this morning, well, Canada needs 450,000 new immigrants every year mm -hmm. from now to the next five years, because the last two census, the last two census, 2021, 2016, the growth has been Mm -hmm. the, the growth of immigrants entering Canada. Otherwise, the population 
will decline because it's becoming old population. Right, right, right. Yes, uh, but I mean, you know, I think that it's it's it it has. It, it changed for better since 1965. Mm -hmm. Although um, there are a lot of issues there. I think I kind of remember, I read something like, you know, di diplomas from Asian countries, from other countries, the, the third world countries are not as good as diplomas in the US. And I think there, okay. are, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain, um, you know, like uh, bottleneck issues. Uh, although uh, Asian immigrants are the fastest growing immigrant population in the US. Mm -hmm, um, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess it's, um, I, immigrants are just contributing a lot, you know, historically and presently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, yeah, so. It's, uh, it's, also, <clears throat> it's also really complex as, as mm -hmm. it is, for example, with um, people that we would call Latinx, for mm -hmm. example, I have a, a good friend, she's a sociologist, actually, you may or may not know her, I don't have to name her. Um, she's from Argentina, mm -hmm. has a Spanish last name, she has blonde hair, blue eyes, and a PhD. Mm -hmm. and that's a far cry mm -hmm. from somebody who's picking tomatoes in South Florida and living in the back of a truck. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. So that's one of the, the problems with this. and and. I would suspect that, that even the term Asian is even more complex mm -hmm. because at least with respect to Latinx people, we're talking about one language plus maybe, you know, local dialects or local mm -hmm. languages in places like uh, Japanese or Oaxaca or the Amazon. Mm -hmm. When we talk about Asians, I mean, I've been to, I, I've started going to India a lot in the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And other than COVID, which has knocked me away from going there for the last four, I made about 10 trips there. And mm. the first time I went, I said, well, you know, I can't be the uh, American who doesn't know the local language. So I guess I have to learn Hindi. Except mm -hmm. then I went to Calcutta and found that I had to learn Bengali. <laughs> Angalore and found that I had to learn Tamil. And there's also Gujarat and Marathi. And uh, <coughs> I could go on and on about mm -hmm. how many different languages there are. Um, yeah, and that's just India. Palestinians are technically considered Asian, although realistically, two things come to mind. One is there really is no such thing as Europe and Asia, and that's mm -hmm. just a racist construct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Geographers, and the other is that much of what we call the Arab world is probably more African than it is mm -hmm. so-called Asian. But that notwithstanding, it's very complex to. To take somebody from uh, northern Siberia, who's who you know lives in the Arctic Circle, and somehow put them in the same, expect the same thing from people who are uh, refugees from Cambodia, mm -hmm. you know it's it's uh, so it's very very complex. But the uh, the the Western mind, if you will, the Western capitalist mind is a better way to put it. Um, just looks for easy answers, you know. Um, Certainly, um, 75 or 100 years ago, the uh, Chinese immigrants, particularly in San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles, to some extent Chicago, uh, were not considered the model minority. Mm -hmm. Racist stereotypes about opium dens and right, right, right. Chinese yeah. tongs carrying knives and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing is true even now when they talk about Jamaicans. Jamaicans and on the one hand, they're considered a model minority. On the other hand, they're considered drug dealers. Right. So they're it's all, it's all yeah. very flexible about how they how they do these things. And and um, you know, it's it's a lot of it is labor market stuff. We know that. Um, right. And some of it is very intentional. Some of it is more like semi-intentional. Mm -hmm. They just try some stuff, and whatever works, they keep doing it. But. Mm -hmm. But that that doesn't always end up in a good place, mm -hmm. uh, because the people that make policy fight among themselves, mm -hmm. and because they fight among themselves, it creates uh, a lot of confusion um, in the whole situation. But um, you know, yeah. Alan, you mentioned something so interesting, and uh, those of us who are immigrants, the homogenization of our experience. 
I, I, I keep saying the moment I cross the border, I become Latinx, Latin, Latinx, or, or whatever. I stop being a particular space out of the 23 countries. The same thing happened with Africa. They become Black African. And yeah. all the difference between exactly what you're talking, Alan, you know, it's not the same situation, but yeah, that's a very interesting process. You know, yeah. I, I, I tell my students, I, I grew up in the East Coast mostly, um, and then moved to the Midwest. And I tell, I tell my students that um, 40 years ago, just 40 years ago, not to mention long ago, we, we had no, there was no concept of Latino. In New York City, there were Puerto Ricans and there were Dominicans, not too many Mexicans. You couldn't find a taco in New York City. Um, Salvadorians, too. Chicago was Mexican Americans, a few Central Americans, Puerto Ricans. And then I tell them that I actually have only met one person in the world whose family name is Latino. Mm. <laughs> and his name is Giuseppe Latino, and he's Italian because Latino is not a Latino name. Latino was an Italian name, which mm -hmm. shows you how, you know, again, the homogenization of, of, uh, of people, which, which is all set against so-called white, mm -hmm. whatever that happens to be. And then some people are allowed to become white, you know, the Irish eventually, the Italians generally, the Jews more or less, um, and probably some section of the uh, Spanish language community as well. Um, although they're, they're kind of fussy about who they let become white because we already see now a huge, huge assault on Asians, I think East Asians, I should say. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the attack after attack after attack on, on the streets. Um, and it's terrorism, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a, a black child in Buffalo or anywhere else, and, and now, a, uh, a child of a Chinese or Japanese descent or Vietnamese descent has to read in the newspaper and wonder whether somebody's going to blow up their school. Mm -hmm. and the chances of it happening are small. The the terror in their mind is very profound. Yeah. And so uh, you know, there's that as well. But um, I know on on my campus for a while we had a large number of uh, students from India and from China because they are a money maker for the school. And the students from in-state cost the university money, students from out of state bring in money. And um, that pretty much came to a dead stop when Trump got elected. Uh, yeah. You know, and then of course COVID aggravated it more, but also because a, uh, a student from, um, Harbin, China, for example, uh, doesn't have to come to the U.S. anymore to get a degree in engineering because the universities are now developing graduate programs uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. So it's not necessary for some to mm -hmm. come here. So, uh, but it's uh, it's 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 not easy to predict how it'll play out because yeah. there are international politics coming in, everything from uh, you know. Russia on the one hand to Turkey on the other and everything in between, you know, South Africa, all these so-called secondary countries are becoming bigger players, um, you know, and, and, uh, it, and China is ascending, or at least they're, they're descending more slowly than the U.S. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder, uh, how, I wonder how remote learning is going to change all of this as well. Yeah, that's a new factor. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine, uh, I mean, I live in Kansas and I teach in Nevada. So I'm sure that you can have um, people not only attending all over the world, but you can have access to instructors all mm -hmm. over the, from all over the world. I mean, I think that it has, I mean, I, I think schools are fighting that like crazy right now. They're desperately trying to keep live classes going and desperately trying to keep, um, you know, the building mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. the center of the school. But I see a lot of pressures towards um, 
you know, I mean, gasoline is astronomical in most places. And, um, you know, all of these inflationary things are going on. And, you know, it's just better from the point of view of global warming mm -hmm. and pollution and all that for us to be less mobile, less, less, uh, you know, and campuses are becoming more expensive to maintain. And even though they're sort of desperately trying to continue the traditional model, I suspect that we're going to see more and more remote learning. And I think that's going to shift. And I would guess, I mean, I kind of even hope that that would be make it more global and more cross boundaries and all that you would be able to um, not only have students from other countries taking classes you know, in different countries, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. also have uh, um, lectures and researchers and so forth, uh, you know, offering courses. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, by, uh, the universities here are trying more of the hybrid model, but you know who, who are complaining? the international students. I am paying four times what the Canadians do, but I'm still going to get Zoom training, and which I'm paying is for the experience of the university, yeah. netting with other people. Meanwhile, the local, I mean, Toronto, Greater Toronto, they want hybrid, exactly what you are talking. They want to be able not to drive, not to commute, not to do a lot of stuff because it's, it's, it's cumbersome. And after two years of, of pandemic, sort of we, we switched very nicely and almost everybody went the Zoom process. I'm smiling because of the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> was it yeah, a cat or a dog? My cat, yeah, my cat. He was knocking uh, the cabin, at the cabinet in the bathroom because he ah. just food uh, and I, I needed <laughs> <laughs> so I, it just, was, I saw yeah. a tail go behind yes, you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I had to. I had to leave just now just to take care of him. Uh, he's, he's, you know, like uh, he's, he's, he's very clean. He's a clean freak. You know, every time he poops, I need to uh, clean up. Uh, uh, it's, good, it's good for the, the smell and everything. Uh, yeah, thank you. So you I'm, serve, I'm, you I'm, serve yeah. him well. <laughs> yes, I'm serving well. I'm sorry about that. But he 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 thinks he's a human. And for me, he... <laughs> 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 so I'm yeah, a, yeah. I'm a little pessimistic about um, the positive aspects of remote learning because my instinct is generally whenever the policymakers come up with something is not for our good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> coming up with remote learning to, to solve global warming. Uh, you know, they don't really care much. Some of them may care about it now, but I think mostly they don't. I think it's more that, um, and again, it's not the same in every country. Mm -hmm. but certainly, um, the, there is an economic crisis there's no doubt about it. I mean, you can have a, a party on a Titanic and eat good food and therefore pretend that the boat isn't sinking. <laughs> but the, uh, certainly in the West, and certainly in the US especially, the fact that they're, they're keeping the body alive by jacking so many drugs into it, which is to mm -hmm. say that that is like giving a starving person amphetamines so they can get up and dance and it, <laughs> and, and, and it pretends that they're somehow healthy again. And that's what basically this massive debt is. And I think that along with that comes a, uh, how can I put it? One of my friends calls it smash and grab capitalism. That is comparable- It's much and grab capitalism, wow. <laughs> where, where the gangs will just go into a jewelry store, smash the glass, grab mm -hmm. something and run away. You know, as opposed to the old imperialists, the old noblesse oblige, the old um, mass murdering racists, but they build libraries, <laughs> you know, <it's> some, <laughs> you know, they build bridges. Now, yeah. who even heard of Elon Musk's name 15 years ago? And mm -hmm. $200 billion is inconceivable. 
you know, <laughs> absolutely inconceivable to, to, to imagine. And it's, and it's fake money. It's only because mm -hmm. people bought stock in his company. It's not mm -hmm. like he has $200 billion worth of highways and factories and oil wells. Um, but I think what goes along with that is the, uh, I don't want to sound, I don't, it's not conspiratorial, it's trial and error, but the pattern nevertheless emerges that there's, there's less of a concern for actually indoctrinating this. I'm talking now about the U S mm -hmm. uh, and indoctrinating the, uh, young people into even patriotism into anything mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. We're not even, we're not even, the young people today aren't even learning about the, the, the rich, dead white men who mm -hmm. supposedly did everything. They're not learning mm -hmm. anything. All that mm -hmm. matters is that they become cogs in the machine. And so education has become much more, um, a small group of people have to understand philosophy and culture. A much mm -hmm. larger group of people has to be trained like cogs in a machine, like workers on an assembly line. And then the great mass, good luck for them. Um, you know, and I think, yeah. so I think that remote learning plays on that as well. I mean, for yeah. example, I've, I've taught race relations, um, variations of it for like 30, 40 years. And, uh, I say to my students, the biggest impact that you're going to have, the biggest way that this university will, um, help develop better understanding isn't from a fake Martin Luther King days when someone gets up and gives a talk about peace and love and ignores talking about racism, or even my class, I said, that's not it. It's, it's when a, a Filipina student and a black student and a white student are all studying together for their nursing exam because mm -hmm. they're worried about whether they can remember all of the different parts of the body, that that's, mm -hmm. that's what really creates globalization from below. And while it's true, we can use this technology as we're doing at this very moment, um, to try to, to, to create that. I think that the fact that uh, uh, a student from, um, you know, Shanghai and a student from uh, Brunei and a student from Palestine and a student from France are all sitting in an, uh, a Zoom room together learning something about fluid mechanics, I don't know that that necessarily is really creating global understanding that much. I think it's just they're trying to, it's just a variation of automation. They're finding mm -hmm. other ways to try to, to cheaply produce as many uh, engineers as they can. Um, even, the, even the sciences, I don't know, uh, my son is a physicist and I know biologists and I know chemists and they say those fields are all drying up because <laughs> they're being replaced by engineering because it's almost like the concern is no longer why, the concern is how. Mm -hmm. How can we glue these things together? Now, I'm being absolutist about it. There are obviously um, elite universities where um, that's still encouraged, which is why actually the elite universities are more tolerant of critical thinking. Because I remember at University of Chicago in particular, the biology department there was completely dominated by radical Marxists. You know, they're all Marxists, eh? Well, mm -hmm. I know Dick Lewinton and, and Richard Levin, you don't know these names, but anyway, they did a whole lot of work on it because the powers that be need to have somebody able to tell them the truth. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the elitist schools will, will allow that. But the great mass of schools like mine, which is a branch campus of Purdue, you know, its main purpose is it's not even to teach patriotism anymore. Its main purpose is simply job training, job training, job training. Mm -hmm. uh, the computer center on campus is called a customer service center. <laughs> yeah, community college, it's even worse. Where mm -hmm. I, I teach at a community college and we're constantly being told that if we don't produce X number of enrollments and don't, mm -hmm. uh, we actually are having to make sure that we cover our expenses with our tuition now for the human behavior department. And we're under, you know, every year we're hearing, well, it's possible that we're going to do away with this major or that major. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the administration is totally into 
how are we going to do business partnerships and, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. you know, and the sociologists in the human behavior department are all talking about um, certificates that we can do for applied sociology so that, you know, and, and um, wow. there's just this real push to connect your, your teaching to a job outcome <laughs> and uh, instead of looking at it as a low cost way for students to move on into four year colleges and beyond it's now becoming the focus to be the trainers what can an aa degree get you kind of mm -hmm. mentality right and student success and customer service you know that kind of thing well, the and, monster in the room is, is the criminal justice, which oh, is yeah. gobbling sociology up all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Southeast especially. This was, I graduated from University of Florida, and my department is now called the Department of Sociology and Criminology. <laughs> it's, Amalgamated. It's, yeah, it's, and when I would go to uh, meetings in the late 90s and um, early 2000s uh, regional meetings like the Southeast uh, Sociology Conference and so forth, all, I mean, like 90% criminology mm -hmm. you know, discussions. And some of it was good. I mean, there was, you know, um, our department had uh, Rattle it. I don't know whether you know his name or not, but he's the guy who uh, did a lot of. Um, work on the death penalty mm -hmm. and so there's you know some good work that comes out of the criminology but a lot of those people were just like how do we build better prisons mm -hmm. you know how do we how do we uh um keep more people mm -hmm. in smaller spaces kind of stuff so you know interesting though um, uh, there's unevenness worldwide so let's the other side of it so that, for example, again, we had over the years probably a thousand students from China over the course of five or six years, and it's a relatively small campus, six, <laughs> seven, eight thousand total. And what I found was that um, a lot of the students reminded me of, of U.S. students in the 1950s. <laughs> that is, they actually are being taught patriotism, they are being taught cultural values, they are being taught uh, soft and, and not so soft forms of nationalism. There is a lot of uh, ideological training that goes on. And mm -hmm. a lot of the students themselves were optimistic, much more optimistic than American students, um, US students, I should say. And um, generally, generally hopeful about the future. And, and generally, actually very humanistic, and, you know, very, very much interested in social justice issues, but at the same time, um, very patriotic, incredibly patriotic, as, as U.S. students were in the 1950s, you know, oh, we're, we're, we are ascendant, not necessarily dominating, it's not like they want to take over Iowa or, <laughs> you know, South Florida. But the idea of, you know, we're going to take our place now mm -hmm. in the world. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a less obviously malignant form of nationalism. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see you know, that. But it's, uh, I, I remember, I, I remember, Alan, remember when the United States needs Canada get the fever, you know? So whatever happened in the state really affected that. Canadians are white Canadian, a mainstream Canadian are not very patriotic. They are not, but they are more and more assimilating that discourse that we need to be all okay. that stuff. Cynthia, are you in North America? Where are you? Cynthia? Um I'm I'm in Washington State. Yes. Okay, I'm you are close, in yeah, I'm close to Canada. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so yes, in, in terms of um, immigration, um, international students and everything, um, I was just reading a book from probably 10 years ago, uh, saying that Canada has more open 
uh, immigration policies compared with the US. Mm -hmm. The US compared with its past has become more and more open to uh, immigration and immigrants. Uh, but um, in terms, you know, because I guess it's because of its, uh, um, you know, immigration history, it has, it has, it has been more restricted compared with Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of people who eventually get their permanent residency and citizenship in the U.S. is only fifty percent of that in the in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, so I'm not saying uh, like, you know, uh, what is good, what is bad. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I, I think, you know, there's the, there's the comparison between uh, Im immigrants before the turn of the 20th century, which, is, which were mostly from Europe and then of the 20th century, particularly, um, well, Af you know, from Asia, uh, South America, Africa. And mm -hmm. there was the change in 1965. But it is still uh, it's still very restrictive. I think part of the patriotism that we see in students or immigrants from Asia, um, China, is from that because when they when they travel, they see the restrictions. You know, when I was a student in the U.S. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, I had to apply for a visa every year to go back to China, and then come back to the U.S. And because I was in the social science, it was not re really bad for, for students in science from China. They often were checked. They, they could not return to the US to continue their, their, their study because they were in a very sensitive um, area, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like um, maybe computer science or biology or something like that or, or whatsoever. Um, so I think it has become better now. Uh, it seems that the policies has become more friendly, uh, you know, compared with, uh, you know, the, to the period from 2017 uh, and, 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 and even earlier. Uh, so, uh, so, but I guess, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things that you can you, you experience on a daily basis. Um, that makes you feel that you're not really, um, you know, I mean, you know, um, China has very open um, policies in terms of people traveling to China. So mm -hmm. like, you know, the visa is very, it's very easy. You don't even have to show up, you know, there's no interviews and everything. It's very, of course, you know, China wanted, um, maybe still wants people to come to China to, to go to China to invest and everything. But at the same time, I think, you know, like uh, it's, it's, not, it's not reciprocal in terms of uh, uh, traveling policies, in terms of, um, I think people, um, you know, like people you, you, you interact with probably are friendly and accommodating and everything. But when it comes to things that would impact your life in very serious ways, like, you know, um, not being able to finish your degree in the U.S., um, not being able to, um, um, you know, like uh, get your, I think, you know, it's, there, there are very good stories, but there are also a lot of, you know, um, policy issues that, that is res restricted to a lot of people. Um, and I think, yes, in general, there is the internal reason for Chinese students, like, you know, there's the education, you know, the civic education. Um, I don't know. Um, some people take that very seriously. Some people don't. Um, you know, it's 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 a, it's a whole spectrum in terms of attitude towards that as well. I think it's the same for U.S. students as well. Some students take that very seriously. Some students are more critical. You know that like. Um, so I think it, 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 it it's a mix. Um, and, um, you know, well, with COVID, sometimes I feel like is all the news I read new, real? Like, I, I, you know, I was just like, I wrote a lot of poetry on Atlanta shooting. Is Atlanta shooting even real? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that. Um, I mean, by, by, by asking, is it real? I mean, like, is it really that bad? Or it's just like, 
is is the technology you know um you know i i um i do see a lot of uh, advantages of uh, technology as a result of covid you know because mm -hmm. we are able to connect you know, like today uh and it's free you know i sent the link uh, of the conference to many to to different organizations you know different chat groups and things like that and and people can just you know like they, they learn about the meetings and they can just uh, you know, uh, log on to participate. I think that's the good thing. I benefited a lot uh, as a result, you know, because I, I lost my job because of immigration status during COVID, you know, August, 2020. Um, I couldn't go back to China <laughs> because of the lockdown. I couldn't stay because of my immigration status and everything like that. But I was able to um, take advantage of all the uh, virtual conferences and things mm -hmm. like that, you know. Um, and yeah, and, and to continue with my work. Um, and um, the bad news is that, you know, after a while, you feel like, um, you know, because of all the scams and everything, I think the security is becoming better. But then you feel like, you know, you're not really having a life, you know, like, uh, you're not able to meet somebody in the coffee shop and cry, you, you know, in his or her arms, you know, for mm -hmm. all of this. And, and like that, uh, or, or laugh together, you know, um, uh, which is the, um, which is also uh, was expected. Um, but I think, you know, if, you know, as COVID is easing, I think, um, you know, when people's, uh, when people can meet in person, we can still, I mean, uh, technology can still be taken advantage of, right? You know, for people who cannot travel, like, like me, I had, you know, I, since to, in December 2020, I had been, um, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of still, uh, I'm kind of like gearing up in terms of being able to work for pay um, a little bit, but uh, it had been exhausting in all, on all, you know, on all um, aspects of life. Um, and, and so, so, so yeah, uh, and technology helps. I mean, you know, if students, are willing to to use technology and work it helps me and everything so i think there are there are there are just um the you know the 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 whole covid situation just exacerbates all the issues in terms of you know like in sociologists race gender class criminologists the imprisonment i was also i was i was detained for 20 hours um because I, you know, I, I was worried about my own security and me and my ex both called the police and two fully armed police officer, male officer showed up. My ex was fully armed. I was the only woman oh, no. and everything wounded, injured and called the police for my own security. And I was taken away and I was misled about my medical condition. And so on the last day when they finally dismissed my case online because I had to have a surgery, um, it, I, I, the, 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 you know, it, it, the fatal, it, the, the problem was like a twenty-five percent fatality rate, and by that point, because of the misleading of the police officers, you know, they didn't tell me what it was when I was detained. It was that was it. You know, the, 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 the surgery was done, and and they just waited to see whether I. I was on the you know twenty five percent silence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Luckily, and there was no mask when I was detained. I had asked, I had to ask for ten hours for to change my mask, and they had plenty of masks there. And it was November twenty twenty. It was no vaccine. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 so and then and also it was detained. I was detained. There was the legal issue, money, you know. And there was, and there was also the charge of domestic violence. Can you mm -hmm. imagine that? Like I said, three fully armed men. Um, I, I was older than my ex. I was wounded and sick. I was not armed um, and everything. And I mean, you know, like we had arguments and everything. Everybody had arguments. Um, it was relationship arguments and everything. And, you know, we were talking about marriage and, and I called the police for real concern. You know, I was wounded, I was bleeding. I was, I was thinking, you know, it was the middle of the, you know, it's 10 PM in November. Uh, and I was asked to leave at that, you know, two days. It was just like, I needed police officer to ask, at least to escort me, you know, 
And so that, that, that is what I got. But anyway, so it was uh, quite, um, I mean, you know, like uh, uh, I'm not without life experience like that, mm -hmm. uh, probably comparable to that or maybe even worse or, or whatsoever. But it's just the fact that, you know, um, um, so, so at a certain point I was just telling people, I was like, nothing makes sense. So when you watch TV, you are educated. Don't expect anything in return when you do good things for other people. In my case, you know, you know particularly in several uh, cases where um, life-threatening situation happens, I got into that situation simply because I was risking my life for others. So what is it? What is this about? And so, I mean, you know, in sociology, like, you know, uh, attributes matter, right? Gender, race, uh, class and everything. In, in China, there's no race um, or like, you know, it's not as intense as in the US. Um, gender, is, China is a highly gendered country. Um, but gender never was, I mean, at least, you know, in my, in my area, you know, it's, it's, it was American studies, we study everything America. Um, so, so, so I, I do think, you know, like the, 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 the reality we live um, and what has been taught and everything. Um, I mean, it's not like, you know, we are teaching everybody to be a treason to, to their country or a treason to their family, you know, um, you know, uh, treated to their family or whatever. But, uh, but, but I, I think, you know, there's, you know, there's a position for educators, right? Um, criminology, sociology, and everything. Um, and so, I mean, of course, I have a lot of good experience in my life as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to, to continue, uh, um, you know, the, my education, even my life or whatever. Uh, it's just that, you know, th there's just so much waste uh, in terms of human talent, human life, and everything. I'm just like, you know, if all the efforts could be combined uh china i think human being probably has already colonized more mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. many times <laughs> so, um, so yeah it's just um you know I, yeah it, it's just it's I, th I think you know the 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 discussion about covid is is really valid i mean i would just like um um I, amazed by um how um um you know, it's, it's, of course, it's for my own sake, for my own very survival, physical survival, spiritual survival, um, and everything. But at the same time, it's from, you know, uh, more than 20 years ago, when I was in China, I was reading a magazine published by some intellectuals. And so at that time, they are saying that how, how, we, how women are treated is not only the issue of women, like, you know, um, women, uh, like, uh, girl children, you know, like infant, infant side of girls. It's not only they lose their lives and everything, it's human, humans are losing 50% of their brain power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, so it's, 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 you know, it's, it's the same thing. Well, China now is kind of adopting two, two child policy, three child policy because of the distortion of the population in terms of age. Uh, and then it's hard for people to give birth now because you know, for, all, for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons is that, you know, like, uh, you know, um, the child, childbearing age women um, are just small in, that, in number. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of like direct um, evidence of like how many lives were wasted, you know, and uh, so, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's, you know, class and everything. So I, it's, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but when immigration is, is concerned is about the immigration policy in the host country, Canada, US. It's about internal policies within the country that have immigrants, you know, uh, going to this, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the left, you know, the countries, the, the home country. Um, it, so I think, you know, it's, 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 
it's it's um, um, immigration is not a very easy decision, and internal Im Im immigration as well. And and um, um, so I think in the U.S. there 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 were several huge like internal immigration like in nineteen. 30s, the internal immigration for African Americans. So yeah, it's just babbling around, but some thoughts, and and I love the the talk anyway. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think I think um, one of the things that moved me from being um, to use labels, I don't like labels, from being liberal to being radical, if you want to call it that, was coming to the understanding that. Um, most of the people who wield power don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care. So you could give them every logical argument in the world. It's like coming upon somebody who's, whose brain is completely, um, completely disoriented with drugs or alcohol, and they come up to you on the street with a gun. And you're trying to explain to them, uh, don't you realize that I need this money for my family? And mm -hmm. also, do you realize you're setting yourself up? That's not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. um, I think I think what's happening in the U.S. I, you know, I mean, I I've taught many students for forty five years at a state university that's very um, multicultural, basically, um, right outside of Chicago, in an, in an area that's basically dying. They're trying in an industrial area around Gary, Indiana. It's called, and um, I think I think the culture of of uh, declining capitalism. Now, one could argue capitalism has been declining since 1900 or so, mm -hmm. uh, but it, but with so many un, with a lot of unevenness here and unevenness there, and the U.S. certainly got a big boost when the rest of the world burned down in World War II, mm -hmm. and that allowed the American century to go on for 20 years or so until uh, Japan and Germany rebuilt. And then uh, China became ascendant, and and, uh, and even places like Brazil and Turkey, um, and um, you know began to develop. But I think the uh, there's an expression that capitalists use, which is "bad money drives out good." Um, as humans, we know that you plan for the future, and capitalist uh, philosophy, capitalist ideology. Uh, pretends to mimic aspects of the, the modern world with respect to science. In other words, you're not going to get an A unless you work hard. You're not going to earn money unless you work hard. If you don't work hard, mm -hmm. you cause cause and effect. Okay, mm -hmm. well, as long as you're not too mechanical about it, cause and effect is reasonable. We 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 want a material world. We don't a material, scientifically based world. We don't want a world based on uh, where mystic spirits decide what's good and bad for you. Um, but the problem is that uh, the, the myth of capitalism is therefore that uh, profit and uh, the social good are somehow related as a parallel to your reward in life because you work hard, except mm -hmm. that the dynamics of capitalism are more like the dynamics of, of a monopoly game, for that matter, the dynamics of capitalist sports, so that uh, the short term almost always supersedes long term. Yeah. You no, know, I have a, a friend, a, a, a working class woman who was born and raised in Gary in very difficult circumstances. and. She, was, she came to me one day, she said, you know, the sociology course talks about how um, low income people don't know how to plan for the future, the present oriented, there's a whole culture of poverty nonsense. Um, she said, you know, she said, but if I don't take care of today, I won't have it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what, what's my choice, you know, <laughs> and I think that um, the system becomes more and more frenetic. The stock market is impossible to predict anymore, except in a sense that some of it is obviously fixed. There's no doubt about that. Um, but for the rest of us, it's impossible to predict. Um, and that's not wasted on the young. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly in the US, especially, 
Uh, that's all I can speak of. I don't want to claim to know no more than that. Young people tend to be short-sighted, impulsive, unable to delay gratification, but they really, really hate dishonesty. They yeah. hate hypocrisy. And that's a tremendous asset, a tremendous strength. So when they smell, and again, I don't mean all of them, because I think that there are some, like the four of us here, for example, who are uh, fortunate or whatever enough to, to have, be able to rise above it and look down on it as if you're in a plane looking down on a forest or something. Um, but people that are in the forest and are just struggling on a day-by-day -day basis, I think they feel much, much more loss of a sense of control. Again, I, I'll refer to my education in the early and middle 1960s when we were supposedly a very negative generation. Oh my goodness, we overturned police cars and we broke windows on college campuses. I, I, I won't tell you all my arrests. Um, but all of that was optimism. That's the irony of it. People never grasp that. The idea was what we do can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And in late capitalism, when less and less is based on productivity, when the jobs in the steel factories have now turned into jobs in the casinos, and casinos are just cannibalism. People basically just, just uh, eating their own self, basically spending money they don't have and leaving that much less to their children. Mm. And the money that's made is by vampires, by parasites. Um, and it's not wasted on young people. You know, when, when you went to work in an auto factory, which I did for a while, um, I hated it. It was hard. It was difficult. It was dirty. It was unsafe. But I was building something. And so indirectly, that aspect of younger capitalism which was still vicious and nasty. It was vicious and nasty and murderous and imperialist, but it wasn't sick. It wasn't decaying from within. And I think I noticed among my students, actually starting around six or seven years ago, uh, attendance began to fall off. I don't require attendance because my philosophy is if you have a kid is there who doesn't want to be there, they're not going to learn anyway. <laughs> and if someone really wants to learn but has to miss a class for a good reason, why should they be punished? Um, but the problem is that, uh, therefore, the number of seats. You know, I, when I started teaching, generally speaking, most, um, this is going to get back to COVID, I promise. Um, <laughs> when I started teaching um, most professors in a, at my school, which is uh, a commuter school, but it is a university, it's sort of a mix of a community college and university, a branch of Purdue. Um, there'd be maybe five, 10% absentees in most classes. Mine was more like 15% because students knew I wasn't tight on it. Um, by 2014, mine was more like 25%. Mm. And yet, this last year since COVID, it's been 40% attendance. I went into one class of 27 and there were four students sitting there. And then another three showed up late, seven out of 27. And this was an upper level class. Now you have these kids coming out of high school where all they did was Zoom the last year and a half. And, you know, they say things like, what, what do I have to learn about how um, Spain supplanted England, I'm sorry, England supplanted Spain in the, you know, 400 years ago, I said, because you have to understand what's happening with respect to China and the U.S. today. It's just a historical pattern. I don't need to know all that. They're doing well with foreign language courses. They're doing well with philosophy. And all those courses, even, even when they taught reactionary pro-capitalist material, racist material sometimes, but what underlay it, underlie it was the idea that there's an order in the universe. <laughs> what you do makes a difference. And so my generation who was you know, brought up in all this patriotic garbage, but we believe that what you did made a difference in the world. 
and these a lot of young people today. And again, I, I would differentiate my the China the students I had from mainland China didn't have this as much of this. They still had the idea that, you know, because China's economy was still relatively growing. Here, a steel mill closes of 10,000 workers, and then a casino opens and hires 800. And the rest of them, you know, the gig economy is a no economy. Gig economy is another way of, of, of people just floating. And I think that then COVID came along and really exacerbated it. You know, when, when, when I started writing and reading, you know, because I came out of an activist tradition rather than a scholarly one. And when I started uh, thinking about this 40, 50 years ago, I fully expected that lay capitalism moves to the right because the powers that be become more crisis oriented and therefore they run out of the ability to convince people. And I fully expected that there would probably be an attempt to build a youth movement as there is in India, for example, uh, run by the RSS that, that has some appeal among youth. That's not what happened in the US. What happened was not that the uh, young people moved towards a kind of fascism. They just moved towards a kind of nothingism. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, they, they, they don't, they don't actually believe the, the extreme nationalists. They're not nationalists particularly. They're actually more anti-racist than my generation was. Along my college campus, I see students of all the different so-called racists chatting completely unselfconsciously. It's not even like I should go make friends with this. It's just like whatever. So, but on the other hand, there's no, there's no uh, macro visions at all. It's just like, you know, n there's no order in the universe. It's this postmodernist culture of just uh, hope I can get through the day. And I think that COVID really exacerbated that because the sense of powerlessness that people feel makes people therefore um, grasp, just grasp uh, one minute of ducking their head down and hoping the storm passes them. And the other minute, uh, just trying to be diverted. I mean, the idea that somebody could play a video game for 15 hours straight, um, how, how different is that than, than drugs? Mm -hmm. And even drugs, I mean, metaphorically, just as a, sarcastic comment, I joked with my students that when I was in college, if somebody wanted to take LSD, they had to commit for 12 hours, 15 hours. And if they use marijuana, they generally had to commit for four, five, six hours. I said, now with today's drugs, you don't even have to commit for 10 minutes. You know, you're up and you're down. It's like you can't even be committed to the damn drug. It's like everything is so short term, and, and uh, I recently came upon an interesting book just yesterday called Lost Focus, which talks about how the technology, particularly cell phones, is just distracting people like crazy. And I think I think COVID is exaggerated. The young people don't know what to believe. They really don't. Yet some of them have had family members die, you know, a million now, actually. But... <coughs> I think that, that that's what, what COVID has done is um, it hasn't caused people to unite together against a common foe. If anything, it exacerbated the, fract the, the fractures in society and uh, caused people to become even more present oriented, more self selfish, more, you know, and, and that then intertwines with the discussion we had about technology because for those of us that <coughs> you know how to use it, that's one thing. But for other people, it becomes their master rather than their, than their slave. And, um, and then I think, uh, you know, again, uh, the false dichotomy between accident and conspiracy in social theory, it's a false dichotomy. To me, it's better understood as trial and error. So there is planning and plotting, but it's not necessarily all done in advance. Different things are tried, and if they work, you know, they're allowed to happen. I mean, a good example of that is uh, exploitative pornography, which at this point, it's not as if um, the, uh, the RAND Corporation or one of these think tanks sat around and said, let's push pornography now. 
it's more like, well, I don't know, this seems to be keeping people quiet. You know, this seems to be dissipating whatever kind of rebellion people might have. Sometimes there are plots like flooding Los Angeles with crack cocaine, you know, 40 years ago. But oftentimes it's just, we'll try this and if it works, and we'll try that and if it works. And um, so, you know, it's, it's the, the impact of, of this has not necessarily been to bring people together. And, <coughs> and it could have been, it could have been, but um, there's money in waste, basically. You know, there's short-term money in, in wastefulness. We, we see it all the time. And that includes the wasting of humans. You know, the, uh, but, but even the captain of the Titanic, he becomes a prisoner of uh, his or her own um, delusions or illusions. You know, some may helicopter away before the boat sinks. But, uh, you know, I think, I think that, uh, this is very. This is a world-changing event. This, this, this absolutely is a world-changing event because it exposes all the fractures in society. Uh, it's not just that a lot of people died, um, and it exacerbates international tension because there's more pressure on all the uh, ruling elites all over the world. So, um, you know. Not to mention the, the other thing we haven't even talked about, which is how all these diseases are caused by mismanagement. Um, I'm not just talking about bats or labs in China or something. I'm talking about, you know, the question isn't, you know, we're sociologists, we're social scientists, we're not um, theologians. The question is not what the genesis of something is, because we know all kinds of things happen randomly. The question is why some of them stick and grow. So <coughs> the question isn't how did COVID come to the US? Whatever we want to talk about from the US point of view. The question is how and why did it spread so much? You know, in other words, what were the social factors? Um, there's gonna be uh, the forests in California are gonna get dry every year anyway. So the question is, what can you do to, to keep people from wandering around in those forests, building campfires during certain times of the year? What can we do to keep it from happening? You know, that's what evolution is. Evolution is based on mutation. Uh, it's not based on natural selection. Uh, natural selection is the, is the steering wheel. But the engine is mutation. So we can't necessarily control how and why random things pop up, but we certainly can control how and why they spread or why they're suppressed. Uh, I'll just finish off. When I was in college now, goodness, 40, 50 years ago, I don't know. Um, we had an old saying that solar power will become widespread when the capitalists find a way to put a meter on the sun. <laughs> um, <laughs> And basically, it, it took 50 years for this technology to slowly develop uh, until somebody thought they could benefit from it. So, um, so all these things are intertwined. All, every, it's all intertwined from globalization to, to technology to, to the fact that the kids can witness live streaming of a mass murderer. Um, and at the same time, they don't know what to believe about COVID. I had a lot of my students who honestly believed for, for months into it that it wasn't real. <coughs> for college students, they refused to believe it was real. And then uh, when they did, they, they, you know, technology allowed the, the worst kind of rumors to spread. Doctors are faking COVID deaths. And these kids would, would take those talking points you know, because they didn't uh, know any better. Um, but you can scratch through pretty quickly. It's just, um, you know, this, this, is, this is not just an important event um, biologically. This is a very, very profound event um, in terms of the decline 
you know, declines sometimes go like this, and then sometimes there's a drop. Sometimes it goes like this, and then there's a little bump up, then there's a drop. This is one of those drops. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I think without a doubt. And um, people did, people have responded. I know people in other countries, um, actually have two people here from South Asia have checked in. Uh, <coughs> I have friends in Calcutta who took to the streets with masks and hand sanitizer. And they just went into the poorest communities and they just threw themselves into it, uh, doing what they could to, you know, in some ways they felt like they were, it was a hopeless task. But on the other hand, I'm sure that there were some people that are alive today that wouldn't be alive if they didn't do that. So there were people that rose to the occasion, but it, but it also created a sense of hopelessness. What I do doesn't make any difference, um, which is which was going on anyway, at least in the Western world. You know, not so much necessarily everywhere, because the economy is not necessarily becoming. Uh, you know, there's there's still uh, how can I put it? There's still uh, profitability that comes from labor rather than from gambling. You know, in in some parts of the world, and in some parts of the U.S., but mostly the, the the long term trend is to try to make profit fast and that becomes like an avalanche that feeds on itself because um you can't slow down as you slow down i mean even mcdonald's has to worry about pizza hut they all you know even if you're at the top you have to worry so that's not wasted on, on young people who you know so Anyway, I guess I tied a trillion things together. I don't know how successful it was, but um, you know, I well, think I think this the the cultural impact of this, the psychological impact of this, is going to want for a long time, um, and it's up to us to try to utilize um, this this experience to expose the cracks in, in the system rather than to have people. Um, just give up hope, which is really, I, I see that so much. I mean, the suicide rate, I mean, what, <clears throat> I haven't looked at the results yet, but this, this term, I asked my students um, to write a short essay, I'm not personal, except I know it would be personal, about why did they think attendance was so low? Why would, seven out of 27 students show up and in the required advanced class why was you know uh, 57 students 18 or 22 showing up in some classes and second of all what did they think that those students were doing during those hours which is actually to me the more interesting question i mean they're still alive they're doing something are they watching tv are they eating are they reading are they playing with their cat i mean what exactly are they doing instead of sitting in that classroom? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of heartbreaking in a way. You know, like I said, I, I fully expected that young people would be a big move to the right as the country moved to the right. That's not what happened. So it was just a move to drifting, which nevertheless still feeds the right. Because, um, you know, the right, the, the right wing is not conservative. I'll just finish up with a quote from Mussolini. He was once asked, well, what is the actual philosophy of fascism? And he said, we have no philosophy. We just, <laughs> we just do whatever we can get away with. Uh, you know, when we sit around trying to analyze what's going on in their mind and they're sitting there laughing while they just robbed the bank. So anyway, I'm done. Well, thank you so much. If I can see a little bit, I, I know Dr. Um, uh, Sanji uh, Tawari uh, is here and uh, I'll, I'll yield the floor very quickly. Well, thank you so much, Alan. I think it's wonderful to use um, the young generation as a kind of like, uh, um, you know, angle to analyze all the issues we have. Yeah, we, we um, I mean, you know, like um, w when I was in college and everything, I, 
I was very hopeful. I was working hard and everything. And I, you know, the, the, the year I uh, entered college was 1989. And so it was, it, you know, like um, in China and the recruitment was cut by half at least and everything, you know. Um, so, um, but uh, I had, you know, like, you know, your personal life and social life always intertwined everything. But, but I think, you know, I think one of the good things about young people is that um, they are hopeful. Um, because of lack of life experience, um, but they want life experience. I think, you know, to know where the students are, college students are now is, is a perfect perspective to, 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 to understand uh, the US as a society. I, th I think, you know, from the pure research statistics, the younger um, the people, you know, the, the younger generation have more kind of like tolerant attitude towards uh, a lot of, you know, like, um, like immigrants or whatsoever, you know, like, so I think it's a good thing. I, I think each older generation, like I'm, I'm probably now, you know, an older generation as well, compared with students in their early 20s, um, you know, early 30s or whatsoever, but um, um, have their legacies uh, as well as burdens, you know, like um, you were talking about capitalism, you know, uh, capitalism, of course, you know, has a lot of problems in China it was like 19 after 1978 it was it was used to kind of like to to get the country out of poverty uh, because China had um, the 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 kind of like a state-run economy you know since early 1950s and to late 1970s and then there was starvation and the more you produce the more you work the the more poverty the more the poorer the country gets so and then you know capitalism was introduced as an as an economic uh, system it seemed to help the country's wealth uh, accumulates but my question really was you know is it whose back was it built on like you know like since women probably were pretty much like <laughs> you know, the new, you know, there were no slaves uh, system, but a lot of women, uh, girls, you know, uh, infant side, and then women are not welcome into the uh, workforce. If they're welcome, you know, they, they have to, to, to work harder to keep their job because they have to give birth to children and all kinds of things, you know, it was quite, um, um, I mean, in the end, poverty rate decreased, which is good, but, but, um, I think a lot of a lot of people did accumulate wealth because of their hard work. Um, I don't want to deny that. At the same time, a lot of the, uh, you know, this is like a <clears throat> guinea box, guinea bottle was opened up, and so um, and all all the other issues are inter intertwined. But I think you know COVID because the older generations, like you know, um, the old the old ideas and everything. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of legacy, uh, there's a lot of assets there, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, um, the younger generation have their own hopes and they, they also have, so I think it's, it's, it would be a great, wonderful research topic to, 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 to work on. And I, 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 my, I mean, I think I'd like to uh, have Dr. Tuari to talk. I'll mm -hmm. stop. Please. Uh, good morning and uh, good day to everybody and I'm at the outset uh, I express my you can say a big sorry for joining a bit late because due to this uh, time specific gap um, I had some very important work back at my institution so I could just now get uh, time to join all of you so apart from listening to Alan I couldn't get a uh, ear to any other talks but uh, nonetheless since the presentation is uh, already over there on the website and uh, let me introduce myself my name is Sanjay Tiwari uh, I come from India I happen to be the uh, managing committee member of the Indian Sociological Society uh, it is the apex body of the uh, professionals of sociology back in India and uh, now I've been associated with this body for almost 20 years and I am a board member elect of this uh, uh, of this society uh, from 2018 terminating to 2023. Then apart from my role as a sociologist, I am also a sports sociologist. I happen to be a 
honorary uh, director of the UP Athletics Association, and I'm also an athlete also. So all these to start upon. And since today's topic and today's virtual conference is basically, you can say, centered around the uh, global political economy, and we talk about the economy in the sense of uh, uh, COVID pandemic, and what lessons can be uh, did we draw, and what lessons can be uh, discussed uh, or rather debated as far as COVID is concerned. So. When we try to study the impact of the COVID for me as an Indian and hailing from the, you can say, the largest democracy of the world, it was, it was for me to decide as to what should indeed be discussed today uh, in the panel and what should we put forth for our spectators and for our viewers to listen and talk about and discuss and learn something. Uh, that how come India tried to come out from this uh, uh, you can say uh, the COVID impact, the impact of the COVID. So there were many, you can say narratives, very many discussions which uh, came into, into place. But for as far as from, for me, the prime thing which came into my mind was to discuss something about reducing inequalities when we try to address the post-COVID and the inter-COVID uh, uh, scenario here in India. So since it, it, was a, it is a big population and Cynthia has already discussed about something about China also. So since uh, she also knows and you also know that we have to combat with the issues of uh, a huge population and distribution of the natural and other resources to the population at large. And when already there has been some uh, uh, inequalities in, as far as the distribution concept is concerned so it was for, for me to sub to decide a topic and i thought that it would be better for me to come out and discuss something about the the prime minister's uh, free ration distributing uh, distribution scheme which uh, was launched you can say just post covid covid really entered in our societies uh, you can say post uh, march 20 or april 20 or something like this so uh, for me as a sociologist, when I talk about food and other things, and I see food as a means of reducing inequalities, I, but I, I, my concept goes that from a sociological perspective, food indeed make, marks a social difference. When we talk about food, maybe not very pertinent. This concept may not be very pertinent when we talk about the western countries or the countries who are more affluent or the countries who are on the on the developing path or other as a developed nation but in economies which is still you can grab they still grab with the uh, issues of hunger and poverty and some other things though, though we have come out of it but then also this covid pandemic what happened is that there was a huge you can say uh, economic slowdown there was reduction of the jobs in the private sectors also. There was reduction in the jobs. There were cut in the wages. There were no jobs for the laborers and the daily wage earners. So there were so many things which uh, put the ordinary man or the lower class, if not to talk about the lower middle class, if I talk about the lower class only, there were so many issues to put these fellows and our country countrymen into dire needs as far as food is concerned. So apart from combating the terror of this pandemic, it was the prime motive of the government of India to think as to what should be in place so that they ensure that people do not starve in want of food. This was the prime thing. And if in case a person will not be getting food, then when we talk about uh, inequalities, naturally there will be a large and a huge gap uh, as far as this uh, 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 this COVID pandemic is concerned. Now, when we talk about this COVID pandemic, we talk about the distribution systems which were basically disrupted. And when we talk about the disruption of the systems, it talks about the distributions also. In India, from the, you can say, early 50s till the late 70s and 80s, we had a public distribution system in force, which was rejuvenated again during the 90s or so. And 
this public distribution system was not very was not very you can say uh, uh, foolproof foolproof in the sense that uh, it was being a uh, <laughs> it was being monitored by some middlemen also who used to there there were cut sizes in between these distribution systems now what was what unique system was adopted by the by this government after the pandemic is that this public free distribution system ensured that the food grains and whatever supply was there was given directly to the beneficiaries this was the basic important thing which i would like to introduce which i would like to pen down over here because as far as the global index is concerned the united nations already in its sustainable development goal has said that we have to see a goodbye we have to ensure that there is a goodbye to the uh, hunger hunger context as till at least till they have made a target till 2030 till by 2030 the un calls on the nations to transform the food systems in such a way to address the food crisis all over the globe not only in india i talk about all over the globe particularly those areas which are affected and which have taken a back seat during the past two two or a half years or so and since the the covid pandemic or you can say the corona virus uh, is a very big you can say uh, diseaser it is changing its 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 faces in every 6 months in every 8 months so we we do not know what will be our destiny in two, in 2023 so that is why now since we have been given some time it is very important for all of us and in particularly india not only to vaccinate all people and reduce the inequalities as far as health is concerned but also reduce inequalities in form of food distribution to each and every person over here so so basically slides were over there i not go into all these slides uh, it must have already been uh, you can say covered or read or or visualized by by people uh, uh, it's like this uh, all the uh, figures over there i'll be open to the house for any of the queries or if in case any more inputs you would like to like to uh, like to ask me i'll i'll be open for this and uh, for jo joining late once again uh, i express my you can say <laughs> sorry to patty cynthia uh, suresh henry and alan and thank you very much i am also done thank you thank you Yeah, I think Dr. Um, uh, Ned Penn is also here, um, and uh, would like to say something. Uh, yes, Dr. Ned Penn, uh, Suresh Ned Penn. You're oh. muted. I don't know whether you realize it or not. He, oh no, we mute. lost him. Um, But yeah, we, we lost him. Yes, yes, yes. Aww. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost him in the cyberspace. Okay. Yeah, we we lost. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he he will come back. <laughs> well, <laughs> technically, the session ends in three minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, if you guys want to go a little over, I'm okay with that. But I know Henry has his session yeah. coming up in a half an hour. So yeah, we will. We can end. in 3 minutes I have a question about India if this probably is not a question that can be answered in 3 minutes but <laughs> um I'm wondering if um the you were talking about food distribution and so forth my understanding is that Ukraine the the invasion of Ukraine is disrupting that quite a bit in that part of the world um but it also might be an opportunity is that right i'm i'm just gathering this from news sources so this is totally you can be skeptical about this but is this a chance for india to fill in some gaps and export more food as well and will that affect internal stuff oh oh patty thank you it's a very pertinent question very pertinent question uh you know basically uh, ukraine has also been one of the wheat producing countries and 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 since it's a you can say war driven state right now 
uh, apart from Russia also. Hmm. So, so India has already uh, requested uh, the United Nations that we are in a position of of uh, uh, of supplying wheat to the tune of seven million tons. India has already said this, and uh, they are apart from I mean, after after assessing our food, uh, you can say uh, requirements. We are in excess of grains. So naturally, this is an opportunity. But let us tell. Let me tell you one thing. As sociologist, <laughs> as sociologist, we have to see priorities, but we, we have to see humanities first, and then business should take a second map. So it is it is an opportunity not only for Ukraine, for some other, as you can say, uh, uh, countries such as Nigeria or other parts of the southern African continent where where there is scarcity of food. So we are trying to do like this. Thank you, Patty, very much. So I have a, I'm kind of like ignorant about India. I also have a question. What is the, what is the, I, I know India is developing very fast and there are a lot of cities that are very modern and everything. Uh, is there a, a still a food shortage within India? Um, and how did COVID impact that? Uh, uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, you know, uh, it's an achievement that during these two years of pandemic, see 2021, 21, 22, we did not see a single death as far as food starvation is concerned, number one. So, so only this huge distribution system was to ensure that the persons who have lost their jobs either temporarily or permanently do not go uh, do not uh, do not feel insecure and starve and and if in case the food supply is affected the inequalities inequalities you can say uh, augment more so it was the prime motive of the government to ensure that at least the barest minimum food and this 5 kg food was full of you can say nutrition also we, the, the government was giving the spices also, the oil also, the wheat and grains and pulses also. So it they tried to ensure that it was not only distribution of a particular rice or a particular wheat only. It was with oil so that they could, could cook also. So as far as we, there is no food scarcity as far as India is concerned and no city is, is dying of hunger or nothing like this. You know, we have already read about Malthus and Malthus has already stated that, it, that a city or a country or a nation only develops when their basic necessities of food, shelter and clothing is met. So I think we are now ahead of this thing. It's like this. Back 22 decades or two and a half decades ago, we were, you can say India was an uh, underdeveloped nation, but now it's not like this. So I think food scarcity is not over there right now. And this, uh, the Prime Minister Modi's scheme has adjusted this to a substantial uh, extent, I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much. I loved our session. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. See you in the next <laughs> meeting. Looking forward to see you in the next meeting. Yeah.